Hello. I want to talk to you today about uh, what happens after Hegel, in particular the, the um, development of the views of uh, Ludwig Feuerbach, uh, Karl Marx, and uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. And this will be the last in the series of lectures in the Introduction to Philosophy course. Uh, we began by thinking about the three problem areas in philosophy, metaphysics, ethics, epistemology. We then looked at three problems, um, rationalism versus empiricism, the distinction between analytic and synthetic propositions, and then the question, of what, the go what is the goal of our knowledge? And then we began to read some classic texts, first uh, fragments from the pre-Socratics, a very weird uh, but interesting lot, uh, a number of dialogues by Plato, and we moved then to uh, Descartes' Meditations, and last to Hegel's Phenomenology, at least that, that small bit of it, called the uh, uh, Dialectic of Mastery of Slavery, Lordship, and Bondage. And then this uh, is uh, by way of, uh, of wrapping up. Uh, so we haven't covered everything in the history of philosophy. We've touched bases with some key problems and some key texts, and, um, and this uh, will conclude. Well, here they are. Feuerbach, Marx, and Nietzsche. Boy, communists have some freaking, freaking awesome beards. See, except Feuerbach was not a communist and Nietzsche was not a communist. There is a direct line from Hegel to Marx. Um, Herbert Marcuse uh, puts it this way, in, 1940, in 1844, sorry, uh, Marx sharpened the basic concepts of his own theory through critical analysis of Hegel's Phenomenology of Mind, the text we just read. Um, he described the alienation of labor in terms of Hegel's discussion of master and servant, although there's been some discussion of Marcuse's claim and uh, it, uh, some have disputed it. Um, it's commonplace about Marx and Hegel that Marx stands Hegel on his head. Marx actually said this. This is true, it seems to me, in at least two senses. First of all, Marx makes increasing sense if you first know Hegel and, and at the same time, Marx does depart from Hegel in some notable ways. If Marx stood Hegel on his head, it's also at least as true that Marx stood on Hegel's head, uh, if not uh, on his shoulders as Newton put it. Now Marx is gonna downplay this debt. Uh, when Marx matures, he's going to be the spokesman for what he and others will call scientific socialism dialectical materialism, and they're going to contrast that with the uh, dialectical idealism uh, of Hegel. Although, in the end, Lenin's going to come back and uh, reread Hegel, and, and, Hank, and Lenin famously said, you know, um, an intelligent materialist has much more in common with an intelligent idealist than with an unintelligent materialist, which is an interesting comment from within that tradition, I think. There's a direct line from Hegel to Marx to repeat, but it also passes through Ludwig Feuerbach. Marx takes off from Hegel's ideas of alienation, slavery, and labor, but he does so by expanding upon the, the left-wing ideas of Feuerbach. Um, Marx was uh, quite clear about this debt. Um, he has a famous pun, there is no other route, road to truth and freedom than through the fiery brook in Feuerbach means Feuer, Fire, Bach, Bruch in German. Um, and of course, one of his uh, most uh, biting trenchant works is uh, Theses on Feuerbach, 11 Theses on, on him. Um, Marx took two things from Feuerbach that are important. Um, an explicit model of the externalization, the objectification and the internalization of subjective consciousness. And secondly, a critique of Hegel's concept of alienation, which brings us to the notion of alienation. Now. In the previous lecture, I discussed some of the weird concepts that Hegel puts forth and mentioned alienation, but deferred that uh, to the discussion on Feuerbach, and here we are now. Alienation has its root in the Latin verb alienare, to estrange. Um, when we talk about aliens in English, it has the same meaning. So someone from another planet is an alien, uh, a stranger. A stranger from another country on planet Earth might be a resident alien. An alien is somebody other. Um, so, for example, um, Alien in the movie is an alien, and uh, Voldemort uh, with a green card uh, also 
a resident alien. In the modern institution known as real estate, if one sells landed property, one, quote, alienates it, unquote, estranges all future claim to it in exchange for a cash payment. And we looked at this a little bit, you know, in terms of the, 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 the Indians selling Manhattan Island to Peter Stuyvesant uh, for $24. Uh, they didn't actually know what they were doing. Uh, they didn't actually do it. Um, Rousseau said of rights that, unlike land, rights are inalienable. Hmm? cannot be a strange. And of course, we've heard this phrase also later from Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence, uh, endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights among these uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, uh, that text engraved on the uh, Jefferson Memorial. Then there's alienation of affection. Uh, it used to be uh, grounds for divorce. Um, a spouse's lover was have said, is said to have alienated their affections, estranged them. Hmm? In post-World War II psychology, uh, sociology, uh, alienation was used to discuss juvenile delinquency and youth culture. Young people were supposed to be disaffected from the norms of culture and society, and they were said to be alienated. The, the 60s term turned off, man, you know, that really captures that sense uh, of alienation. Um, was a uh, common jargon among the existentialists. And uh, Saul Bellow, who's, who's a marvelous, you know, has a marvelous acid wit, uh, has his character Moses Herzog uh, denounce this usage in the following terms. When he, when he complains about the common places of the wasteland outlook, the cheap mental stimulants of alienation, the cant and rant of pipsqueaks about inauthenticity and forlornness. I can't accept this foolish dreariness. However, none of these commonplace senses of the terms alien, alienation, the extraterrestrials, the green card holders, the estrangement of land, the estrangement of spouses, turned off problem children, pipsqueak, cant, and rat. None of these is going to be useful in understanding alienation in the sense we need to understand it here. Hegel himself conceives alienation in some complex ways. Feuerbach uncomplicates Hegel by going off on one particular tangent and Marx, this is the tangent that Marx follows from Feuerbach. Let's think back to the dialectic of master and slave from the phenomenology. Um, it starts, as we noted previously, with interaction. Uh, two proto-human beasts confront each other. Each recognizes the other. Each consciousness becomes duplicated uh, in that simultaneously I am aware of myself and I am aware of myself because I see myself reflected back to me via the look. There is an alienation and an estrangement involved here in that I extend my own self-concept to incorporate how an other, a stranger, an alien sees me. And this is a mutual process, it's a two way, two way street. From the outset, uh, one alienates to a certain extent one's own being and then one recovers that alienated being via the look, though in slightly changed form. After the phenomenology, Hegel is going to expand his story from this point of departure in social psychology from which he begins. He's going to come to see a larger picture, uh, like individual consciousness, Geist on the whole. And again, we talked about that complicated term a little earlier. Uh, has alienated itself, but it's going to come over time to recover itself. Social psychology is just a microcosm of a larger macrocosm. And so the development of individual cells is really only a phase. Ultimately, Geist as a whole is going to recover from that alienation, which includes uh, the, the distinction of individuals, and then history will end. Um, at the end of the day, all parts will be reconciled in the whole. The aim of knowledge, says Hegel, in the phenomenology, is to divest the objective world that stands opposed to us of its strangeness and, as the phrase is, to find ourselves at home in it. So from the long range view, the larger view, later view of Hegel, uh, individual consciousness is just a passing fancy. And history is going to end in the overcoming of all alienation, including that sort of uh, individual uh, individuality. Where Hegel's going there is toward a kind of mysticism. All is one. Tatvamasi, wherever I looked, I saw myself. Or back to Parmenides, or possibly the Buddha, or possibly John Lennon. I don't know. Um, but as I said before, uh, in order to understand and use Hegel, you don't have to go all the way down Hegel's Schlesse with him. Uh, it's, it's there to be used for cash value, as it were, pick and choose. From the time Hegel wrote the phenomenology until he died, and that was from 1860 to 1831, he had this whole great system, a system of everything. And um, something that the, the theologians might call Heilsgeschichte, the history of salvation. 
Well, I guess we can say to Hegel as a <laughs> we can say to August Comte, there's a statue of August Comte in the Sorbonne, and somebody graffitied it recently. Thanks for everything. Both Hegel and August Comte had uh, theories of everything. But we might say thanks, but no thanks. Um, we're going to ignore the Heilsgeschichte. We're going to ignore the Parmenian, Par Parmenian, and Par Parmenian, Parmenian. <laughs> Okay, you got the idea. Mysticism and metaphysics of history in favor of following out Hegel's social psychology. Now, as we've seen, Hegel left in his wake uh, a group of radical followers, the young Hegelians, Marx among them. Um, and Hegel's followers develop a cottage industry, uh, pointing out where Hegel fell short, famously Kierkegaard. The philosopher constructs a palace of ideas and lives in a hovel next to it. Okay, Feuerbach and Marx are going to take the idea of alienation from Hegel. They're going to upgrade it. Um, Marx and Nietzsche are going to take up the issue of slavery, uh, each of them attempting to show that there's a dialectic that goes beyond Hegel's dialectic. So let's think here about how alienation figures in that whole scheme. In Hegel's analysis of alienation, the slave externalizes her inner being in the shape of the products she produces, labor. We've also considered the criticism which Marx advances that the, the process of alienation is not merely a process of externalization of one's being, it's also a process of loss. And Marx is gonna go on to claim in general, the laborer is deprived, although surreptitiously deprived, both of his very being, which he externalizes into the products that he produces and of his property claim to the products of his labor, at least to part of them. Marx seems to get this idea, though, which he applies to economics from Feuerbach. And Feuerbach first worked this out on rather different grounds, on the grounds of religion and the production of the gods. So the source of Marx's critique of profit, strangely enough, um, is in Feuerbach's critique of the gods. Now, let's look at that. Feuerbach um, goes off on a tangent from Hegel. It's an interesting tangent. He begins by drawing a distinction about perception. There's sense perception, as I can perceive uh, an object putatively in front of me, but there's also non-sensuous perception. I can perceive something which is not available to me through my sense experience. Um, for example, we talk about society all the time. And as Durkheim would insist, society is an objective reality, but it's not tangible. And even though we all acknowledge it uh, and its force, uh, it's not that we have some kind of sensor, direct sensory experience of it. We experience it indirectly in some other ways. What might Feuerbach mean by this distinction? Um, what he says is in sense perception, consciousness of the object is distinguished from consciousness of the self. Um, so if I see a tree, then the tree is not me psychologically at least, although again, you know, we've already talked about uh, the way in which Descartes and Kant raises uh, epistemic questions about, you know, just what the relationship is between percept and object. Hegel's birth of consciousness also involves sensuous perception. It's two bodies interacting. You know, they do encounter each other in the flesh. They co-create themselves as mindful bodies. You know, they confer this each on the other, in the meanings of the German word. Um, the perception uh, each takes from the other is two-sided, uh, a double duplication and a double sense and all that stuff that he goes on about, we've already seen in the phenomenology. Either sort of perception, either me the individual seeing the tree or me the individual becoming uh, an individual by interacting with another embodied being, looking, using you know, the look at each other. These both exemplify uh, what Feuerbach means by sense perception. Um, despite the fact that one is solitary, the other is social, the psychology is identical. What if instead the object of my perception, though, is not sensuous, if it's perhaps invisible? And uh, we've heard this one before, right? The invisible gardener. Um, there's a gardener, he tends to garden, we just can't see him. The barbed wire doesn't snag him. The bulldogs don't find him. We can't smell him, taste him, touch him, hear him, any of that kind of stuff. And yet the believer still says, well, absent evidence of a visible God, tangible God, um, God's still there. And the skeptic says, no. And the skeptic might very well ask the question, why do we even have this idea of an invisible, intangible, eternally elusive God in the first place? Immortal, invisible, God only wise. Uh, 
as the idea of God has evolved uh, in Judaism, uh, later Judaism, uh, Christianity, Islam, it's come to seem impossible that a God could exist in visible bodily form, apart perhaps from a very brief incarnation, although and we talked about this in the earlier discussion, uh, plenty of times and places in which uh, uh, gods were thought to be visible, no, no contradiction there. But in any case, uh, for us in later history, God is not thought to be palpable to sense perception. And so Feuerbach goes on to say, here may be applied to non-sensuous perception without any limitation, the proposition, the object of any subject is nothing else than the subject's own nature taken objectively. Now, in order to expound Feuerbach on this, I have to become a little bit anachronistic and introduce the metaphor of a movie projector. Um, what Feuerbach seems to be saying in effect, without any independent sensuous object, what operates is projection. And that is a one-way relation, not a two-way relation. This is how Feuerbach uses the notion of alienation as externalization. Again, that's not his own term, uh, but he uses the basic idea. And of course, he wouldn't have had the metaphor of our movie projector, but the, the idea is there. Um, now, there are two German words translated as alienation, in Fremdung and in Um And they mean respectively estrangement. So this notion of alien, alien being stranger comes up in the Fremde bit. Fremde is German for stranger. And the Entäußerung, uh, externalization, basically divestiture, um, the movie projector metaphor, I think, captures both of these senses. But it's the Entäußerung, the externalization uh, sense of alienation that, that's most important for Feuerbach. Um, projection is a rich idea, actually. Uh, Schaupt uses it, Heidegger uses it. We're projects to ourselves. That's one of the things that distinguishes being uh, for itself from all the other beings in itself, et au um, is caused by its future, not by its past. It's caused by us visualizing what we're going to be and making that come to, to pass, making that so. Freud, of course, uses the notion of projection. He goes on to show how this works, even with sensuous perception interaction. We can make things up even when there are some things uh, uh, there. Um, so, you know, you want to kill me, Dad. I'm projecting my Oedipal uh, desires to kill Dad on Dad. That happens all the time. Now, what are the sense of alienation expressed by the other German word, Entfremdung, uh, estrangement? Entfremdung happens in Feuerbach, but it happens subsequent to Entoisol. And I'm going to rely here in explicating Feuerbach on uh, Berger and Luckmann, uh, the social construction of reality. I'll talk about them a little bit uh, uh, later. Uh, who, who have this whole uh, analysis of how we construct our societies and in the, in the process of extrication, try to reconcile uh, Emil Durkheim's claim that society is a thing, uh, treat society as an object with Max Weber's uh, claim that society is basically nothing other than the ensemble of social actions. Um, and, um, and basically uh, they attempt to achieve a synthesis of those two views. Following their lead, I want to translate Entäußerung as projection externalization and Entfremdung as objectification, reification. I'll explain that a little later. Here's the big thing about Feuerbach. Everybody remembers him for if they remember him. But unfortunately, not enough people do remember it. Um, for Feuerbach, God does not make man. Man makes God. Religion is a process of production, process of production in which the human gods roll off human assembly, the gods of humans roll off the human assembly lines. Um, and the labor of all religious people is to produce their god. They do so in a threefold dialectical process. First of all, they project, alienate, externalize in that sense, their being. Secondly, they objectify, in that sense of alienate, or reify, make thing-like, that's what reify means, this being once they have projected it, and thirdly, then they re-internalize this as if it were something pre-existing them rather than their own product. So it's a threefold process. Projection, objectification, reification, in other words, and then internalization. People project their being, they objectify, and then they internalize. Now, this shows us both of those senses of alienation working. Alienation as externalization, alienation as estrangement, the reification bit, taking, taking one's own product to be um, something other than one's own product is a process of estrangement, of loss, a loss of control. 
and uh, loss of ownership. Okay, central casting. Since Jerry Falwell is no longer around, uh, his, uh, his red phone hotline directly to God is still available. Central casting picks it up and uh, calls uh, God and says, yeah, my next film is going to be God the Biography. Uh, you get any suggestions of who's going to play you? Yeah, I got one. Perfect. Okay. Morgan Freeman played God in the film, Bruce Almighty. Uh, let's see how Morgan got to be God, according to Feuerbach. Okay, earthly Morgan externalizes himself first, projects his being. Secondly, Morgan takes his externalized being to be instead a heavenly object independent of him. And thirdly, earthly Morgan internalizes this idea, thus ratifying his mistake from step two. Man, says Feuerbach, this is the mystery of religion, projects his being into objectivity, and then again makes himself an object of this projected image of himself, thus converted into a subject. And more than that, there's a loss. To enrich God, man must become poor, that God may be all. Man must become nothing. So notice that in the process of alienating, externalizing himself, Morgan is also diminishing himself. Uh, the same process does both. Man creates God and man diminishes himself one at the same time. Now, in this scenario, Morgan has disadvantaged himself, and he's done so in two distinct ways. First of all, he's fooled himself. He's acquired some false consciousness. He fails to understand that what he's worshiping as a heavenly being is just himself, which he has alienated, projected from himself. And secondly, he's disadvantaged himself by self-abasement. He's impoverished himself. He's given up all his best qualities to the heavenly being, and now he's but a miserable, diminished sinner groveling before that heavenly being of his own devising. Hmm? So God is enriched, he's all powerful, he's all knowing, he's all good, he's just, he's merciful, he's happy. And to make God that way, man has to become impoverished, weak, ignorant, sinful, criminal, pitiless, miserable. Feuerbach notices that the qualities inscribed to God tend to be human. Yahweh is a man of war, Allah is just and merciful. And if so, the more human virtues man projects on God, the less human virtues man has for himself. Um, we looked at Feuerbach in an earlier lecture on, on metaphysics, how he responded to the denial that God has human qualities, which, which intends to be a defense of God, but Feuerbach actually thinks is a form of atheism. It, it uh, backfires on itself. So, for Feuerbach, does God make man? No man makes God. Religion isn't the opposite of idolatry. Rather, all religion is idolatry for Feuerbach. Now, Nietzsche is going to offer us an explanation later on for how this came about, how it came about that humans impoverish ourselves by projecting our best qualities onto the gods. And this little bit of contemporary atheist propaganda cribs from Feuerbach's question, why are the attributes of God always such human qualities? Look in the mirror and you'll see him. That's why his opinions are yours, why only the parts of the Bible you like are, more, are true, uh, why he knows you so well. Um, because he's you, and he only exists in your head. Notice here how Feuerbach's mirror image differs from the looking glass self. The latter is interactive and sensuous. The former is not. It's simply projective, non-sensuous in Feuerbach's term. So Feuerbach, in effect, is a creationist. Hmm? He believes that man created God. Now, Feuerbach, by the way, wasn't the first one to entertain this idea. Xenophanes said, what if cattle and Lion, horses or lions had hands or were able to draw with their hands and do the work that men can do. Horses would draw the form of gods like horses and cattle like cattle. And um, they would make themselves, uh, make their bodies uh, such as each had uh, themselves. Yeah, if uh, lions made laws about homicide, you were hungry, case dismissed, right? Now, one could simply stop at Feuerbach's theological point that all religion is idolatry. But Feuerbach goes beyond that. He doesn't stop there. Oops. He goes beyond theology to found the sociology and anthropology of religion. Theology is anthropology. That's his message. What makes Feuerbach especially interesting is that he goes just beyond the theological insight to suggest some more general points about human beings and the way we construct our cultures. For instance, um, Back to Xenophanes for a minute. Let's uh, look at, oops, there he is, okay. Mr. Ed. Hello, I'm Mr. Rail. 
Yeah, a TV sitcom from the 60s. Uh, uh, the horse could talk, but only to his master. If horses did make horse gods, by studying the horse gods, one might learn something about the horses who made them. So, you know, I guess Mr. Ed's a good candidate for a horse god. But then you would learn about horses by studying him. Uh, for it would only be the horse essence which got alienated into their gods in the first place. By his God, thou knowest the man, says Feuerbach, by the man his God, uh, the two are identical. So once you properly understand theology, Feuerbach says you have an entry into, entry into anthropology. Um, likewise, if man makes God in his own image, there are different images of God available. Therefore, we would expect that these would be the product of different sorts of societies. Guy Swanson, the sociologist of religion, birth of the gods, uh, monotheism is positively related to the presence of a hierarchy of three or more sovereign groups in a society. So there's some, if you find a monotheistic religion, that points you in the direction of looking at something in the social structure uh, wherein that God is produced. By his God, thou knowest the man, and by the man his God, because the two are identical. Feuerbach here is giving the founding charter for the sociology of knowledge. To understand ideas, you first look to praxis. Uh, Marx gets the credit sometimes, but, you know, he really got that from Feuerbach. He added social class into the mix after Feuerbach's proposed the motion, Marx and Nietzsche seconded it. So Marx says the ruling ideas of each age have been the ideas of its ruling class. Life is not determined by consciousness, but by, by consciousness by life. Nietzsche says, if you look at the slavish virtues, you have a clue that these were produced by slaves. In the 20th century, Wittgenstein would say famously, meaning is use. Now, a lot of stuff in Wittgenstein seems obscure or narrow or even, even mystical in some cases, but if we take this to mean broadly a methodological hint to look for meaning in praxis, then Feuerbach and the others are saying something not dissimilar. To understand the concept of consciousness, look to the pragmatic functional circumstances which produce it. Of course, Wittgenstein's language philosophy is very, very different, but their common foil is platonic realism. And to find meaning in nothing but use, not in essences, or to find the truth of the heavens on earth, not in the Empyrean realm, well, the enemy of my enemy is also my friend. So, so Nietzsche and, and the others have, or Nietzsche, sorry, Wittgenstein and the others have, have a common enemy. Also, religion changes. Um, in particular, the boundary between religion and its opposites is quite permeable. Uh, Feuerbach quips, uh, what was at first religion becomes in a later period idolatry. What is today considered atheism is tomorrow considered religion. Why did the Romans feed the Christians to the lions? Well, because the Christians were atheists. Um, we saw the Mel Brooks clip from History of the World. Oh, those Christians are laugh right at their soul poor. How poor are they? They're so poor, they only have one God, one God. Hmm? Yeah. Um, well, okay. To uh, monotheist, it looks like monotheism, but to a polytheist, it looks like downsizing. And so Alistair McIntyre says, uh, and he's got a point here, I think, the first theist is also necessarily the first atheist. That is, if you come into a polytheistic situation and you proclaim one God, you have to do so by knocking down all the other gods, competing gods, to leave just one standing. And again, you know, uh, to crib from some contemporary atheist propaganda, we're all atheists about most gods. Um, you know, Christians don't believe in uh, Buddha, don't believe in Allah, don't believe in uh, Augustus, uh, don't believe in Zeus, etc. Um, and the atheists just go one god further. Religion changes, and what was yesterday uh, religion is today irreligion. Um, take the current right to life movement, okay? It's a rationale for opposing abortion. Initially, this was a Roman Catholic movement. The conservative Protestants have come on board subsequently. But the movement asserted that the conceptus, conceptus is a blanket term for fetus embryo, um, uh, has a uh, has an absolute right to biological viability, okay? Such that not even the life of a clearly living mother could trump that right to viability. Now, 
it's not always noticed that this is extremely, extremely an unusual view for the Roman Catholic Church to hold. In earlier centuries, church might very well burn your body to save your soul. To say that there is an absolute right to biological viability would have been heresy. Um, Christianity has long held on to that platonic dualism whereby spiritual values outrank material values. You know, popular Platonism, as, as Nietzsche would have it. So the assertion that biological life as such is sacred is not indeed a traditional Christian value. You can find it in certain Hindu traditions of the Jains, for example, um, but not the traditional Christian uh, uh, virtue at all, quite the contrary. And as um, Simone Weil, um, the Christian mystic said, one cannot imagine St. Francis of Assisi talking about rights, you know. Um, so again, kind of weird for the Roman tradition. Uh, what was it once, what was once your religion is today religion. What was it? First religion becomes in a later period idolatry. What uh, is today considered atheism tomorrow is considered religion. Recall from the earlier discussion of Hegel, um, the term God is ambiguous. That is to say, it, it admits of more than one legitimate meaning. That's what ambiguity means. It's not just a uh, vagueness. Um, and we talked about belief in God. One third of Americans profess belief in a higher power. But of those people, some of them are people who claim to believe in God and some of those are people who claim to disbelieve in God. And yet they both, both, both sets, subsets of both, both believe in high, a higher power. Um, yes, the higher power, we've heard about the higher power. Alcoholics Anonymous, did Bill W. take a leaf from Feuerbach's book? Um, 12 steps. Step one, admit that you're powerless. Step two, surrender to a power. Step three, that is God as you understand him. This is a perfect example of what uh, Feuerbach is talking about. You've got projection, you've got object objectification, and you've got internalization. Um, it's a transparent way to grasp Feuerbach's point. Uh, it's, if anything, clearer in the case of Alcoholics Anonymous than it is in the case of conventional religious. You know, typically, religious don't say, believe in a God, any God of your choice, you know, like Macy's puts up at Christmas time, believe. Well, no, belief is transitive, and religions typically say, believe in our God, believe in this God as opposed to the other God, believe in the one true God, believe in Yahweh, Allah, Jesus, etc., whoever, um, and who exhibits the specific properties of fill in the blank. Contrary to Feuerbach, they believe, typical religious believers, that their God came before them, that God created them, that they're, uh, they're not the creators of God. A's higher power, though, is, uh, is, is a little uh, squishier. Um, the AA follower chooses the power, as long as they acknowledge the power to be higher than themselves. So I think it's Feuerbach in a nutshell. Could Feuerbach's analysis be extended beyond its initial scope, that is, to garden variety religion? Well, Alcoholics Anonymous may not claim to be a religion, may claim not to be a religion, may in fact not be a religion, but it invokes the word God, if not always the Christian idea of God, uh, and so seems subject to Feuerbach's inquiry. Famously, Marx later went on to apply the same sort of analysis that Feuerbach used with the human production of God to examine the human production of commodities in economic life. Um, and that takes us to Marx. From Feuerbach on religion to Marx on production. Feuerbach thought that the gods were produced by a human assembly line. Marx applied Feuerbach's analysis to actual assembly lines. Marx greatly admired what he thought were advances in philosophy made by both Hegel and Marx. Again, there's a direct line uh, among the three of them. Young Hegel, as we've seen in the phenomenology, hit on the idea of labor as the source of value in an alienated manner. Feuerbach saw that the process of alienation or projection could be used to understand how and why people create their gods. With this specific criticism of religion, Marx was also in agreement. Um, the opium of the people, it's often attributed to Marx. He cribbed that from Charles Kingsley. Um, and um, with an obvious debt also to Feuerbach, Marx wrote the following in criticism of Hegel's philosophy of law. Religious distress, he said, is at the same time the expression of real distress and the protest against real distress. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, just as it is the spirit of a spiritless situation. It is the opium of the people. The abolition of religion as the illusory happiness of the people is required for their real happiness. The demand to give up the illusion about its condition is the demand to give up a condition which needs illusions. 
that was the final draft. Perhaps the earlier draft was uh, religion is the chicken soup of the masses, but then he got it right. You think beer goggles are bad? Dude, dog, lose those God goggles. Opie of the people is like, worse for you than beer, man. Marx's opposition of religion often seen narrowly in terms of religious religion's function of recognize, reconciling people to the short end of the stick, the opium analogy. For Marx, religion is that. Um, but as will be obvious from its roots in Feuerbach's analysis, it's much more. Feuerbach attempted to show us how religion damages humans psychologically because it impoverishes them quite generally. Self-deprived of their best moral qualities, they act against their own best interests. In his work, The Holy Family, Marx quotes a French revolutionary obscure fellow uh, whom Feuerbach might well have been channeling. The great appear great in our, our eyes only because we kneel, let us rise. Apart from his general agreement with Feuerbach uh, about how religion debilitates and impoverishes, Marx has a bone to pick with Feuerbach too, and likewise with Hegel. It has to do with the last bit, uh, that we just quoted uh, back a couple of slides. The demand to give up the illusion about its condition is the demand to give up a condition which needs illusions. In Marx's view, Hegel and Feuerbach were content just to criticize the false consciousness of the intellectual formulations. And the next step is to abolish the false conditions. Philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. Uh, the 11th thesis, famously 11th thesis on Feuerbach. And in the fourth, fourth thesis, uh, Marx uh, said also the following. Feuerbach starts out from the fact of religious self-alienation of the duplication of the world into a religious world and a secular world. His work consists in resol resolving the religious world into its secular basis, but that the secular basis detaches itself from itself and establishes itself as an independent realm in the clouds can only be explained by the cleavages and self-contradictions within the secular basis. The latter must therefore in itself be both understood in its contradiction and revolutionized in practice. So Marx is criticizing Feuerbach for having his head in the clouds, but you might ask whether Marx isn't just out Feuerbaching Feuerbach because it was Feuerbach who first said, in order to understand the heavens, look to the earth. And, and that's what uh, Marx is now excoriating him for not doing. Um, this is what's commonly meant about Marx turning Hegel on his head. Um, in Marx's view, Hegel and Feuerbach, uh, they wouldn't be distinguished here in that respect. Only looking at the history of ideas, only looking at the clouds, and Feuerbach follows Hegel into confusing the history of ideas with history per se. But merely changing ideas is not gonna change the circumstances, what Marx calls the secular basis. And these, the, the secular basis, these material circumstances are at the root of the ideas themselves. The idea, the ruling ideas are the ideas of the ruling class. So Marx demands accordingly the abolition of philosophy and replacing it with economics and sociology and of course, political action. Philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. So here Marx does go a step beyond Feuerbach. The point is to change it. And so we go from Hegel and philosophy to Feuerbach and sociology of religion and Mark, to Marx, political economy and political action. All right, now let's ask a question. In Marx's view, how does the alienation of labor transpire in the process of economic production. Okay, here we're gonna call on Morgan Freeman once again. Um, Marx adopts the very same analy analysis begun by Hegel and applied by Feuerbach to religion, but Marx is going to apply it to the production of economic commodities. So let's this time have Morgan Freeman cast in a different role, not a religious believer who takes his own image to be God, but a factory worker who produces widgets for the boss. There's the widget, there's the boss. Okay, so. The process, alienation, objectification, internalization, parallel with the previous case. First of all, Morgan externalizes himself as Hegel's slave did, giving up his labor power, putting it into the object his labor produces. A similar process of false consciousness takes place. Morgan reifies the widget, seeing it as a fetish. He makes a thing out of it as if it were independent of the power, his labor power, which produces it. And then thirdly, Morgan receives back his product, but in this case, only a fraction of what it's worth. Um, because there's a fourth step in here, the boss sells the widget. Um, 
and he sells the widget for at least X dollars, keeps at least Y dollars as profit, and he gives uh, X minus Y as wage to Morgan, the laborer who produced the project, uh, the, sorry, who produced the product. So Marx then generalizes Feuerbach's dialectic of externalization, objectification, internalization from man's production of the gods to man's production of economic commodities. Berger and Luckman, and I mentioned them before, have come back to them in the social construction of reality, 1966, um, would generalize further to man's production of society and culture as such. Now, um, a little shaggy dog. Okay, the Roman Catholic Church has not been particularly friendly to Marxism, even though there has been liberation theology. Um, the last couple of popes have been very, very hard on it. The current Pope, Pope Francis, uh, a little less so, but but you know, a lot of Roman Catholic seminary students are quite wary, come to seminary quite wary of Marxism. Um, here's a, an example of a, of a conservative Catholic critique of that. Father Gregory Baum, a uh, friend of Peter Berger's, incidentally, um, Canadian theologian, he told me a story once. He would, in teaching seminary, he would take the students through reading Berger and Luckmann, and they'd get very excited about the ideas there. Once they had developed their enthusiasm for it, he would let the cat out of the bag. You know what? You guys have just learned Marxism. They were a bit taken aback. Now, Berger and Luckmann are not doctrinaire Marxists. Indeed, Berger especially is extremely conservative. He thinks the Austro-Hungarian Empire was a very, very good political arrangement. It's kind of a rare idea even among conservatives. But uh, the point is that the intellectual structure which they apply to the social construction of culture is the same one Marx adopted from Hegel versus Feuerbach, Hegel via Feuerbach. It's, uh, it's not uh, at all uh, um, due to political considerations. And indeed, Berger's next book applies their analysis specifically to the sociology of religion, The Sacred Canopy, 1967. Uh, well worth reading. Um, it is neither a treatise on atheism, nor is it Marxist agit prop, agitation propaganda. It's an application of Feuerbach to analyze how this dialectic externalization, objectification, internalization is to use collectively to construct our religious institutions, including our deities. And again, to say it's well worth a look. So um, the basic idea of Feuerbach then works itself out in a variety of ways, not, not all of them political. But let's go back to Marx. Morgan Freeman, the factory worker, which widget producer, sold his labor power, it's worth X dollars. In exchange, he's been paid a wage uh, that is X minus Y, that is to say less than X. He hopes it's a living wage. He hopes he can feed his family, uh, clothe them, shelter them, um, and that will let him come back the next day to sell his labor power once again, and, and so it goes. Um, but Marx insists, famous distinction, that Morgan is being exploited He's being exploited even when he's not being cheated, even when workers are paid the fair wage. They are being exploited in that profit is being extracted from their labor and the wage that they're paid is less than the actual value of their labor power. And were this not the case, there would be no profit. Profit is only that fraction which is extracted from the labor before the compensation is paid back, uh, deducted compensation is paid back to the workers. Um, for example, um, the current federal minimum wage, $7.25, uh, agreed upon as fair in some way. Well, people are challenging this. There's a talk about the $15 wage. is way less than what the minimum wage would have been if it kept pace with productivity. Um, in other words, even though it's agreed upon in law, um, this would imply the minimum wage is not, in fact, a fair wage, and this is what's fueled the movement to raise that wage. Um, Elizabeth Warren. If we started in 1960 and we said that as productivity goes up and it, it has, then the minimum wage is going to go up the same. The minimum wage today would be about $22 an hour. So my question, with the minimum wage of $7.25 per hour, what happened to the other $14? It certainly didn't go to the workers. The New York Times would quarrel with the numbers here, uh, but whether Warren's right or it's right or anybody in that ballpark is right, there's still a substantial amount of money not going into the pocket of the wage laborer. Um, it would amount to a very drastic change if the minimum wage went from seven dollars and twenty-five cents to twenty-two or even seventeen per hour. I suspect Marx would want to argue that even if such a drastic change were to occur, 
and the workers were not formally cheated of a large percentage um, of the proceeds of their labor power by being paid relatively low wages. The end of cheating would not be the same thing as the end of exploitation. Profit taking as such for Marx amounts to exploitation. Uh, there can't be profit taking without there being a cut taken. So even if Morgan has been paid a fair wage, for example, the going rate, Marx would nonetheless would argue nonetheless that Morgan has been exploited in this exchange of labor power for wages. Um, y gets extracted from x, however big or small y is in relation to x, and the wage is always x minus y. How can wages be simultaneously fair and also exploitative? Marx would respond, well, consider what value the boss adds to the process of widget production. Yeah, how much does he add? Nothing. As the IWW, the Wobblies used to say, the boss needs you, you don't need him. Now, this is the labor theory of value, as it's often called, and there are great scholarly disputes about whether and to what extent Marx held this uh, and whether and to what extent it's true. But one standard way to read Marx, and this is a, excuse me, a, a, a common cartoon, um, is, is in the following way. Um, so the worker says to the boss, uh, why is it that I work for you? We workers make all the goods, you bosses make nothing. Ah, but we are job creators. We own the means of production, like the machine you're using there. So who made the machine? Well, it wasn't the boss. Um, and that leads us to uh, the topic uh, Marx discusses as the fetishism of commodities, and he includes money uh, in that uh, analysis of fetishism. Now, here's an annoying question. If Morgan, the worker, is indeed being exploited, why doesn't he just do the math? Well, labor power he sells to the boss is worth X dollars. The wage the boss pays him is X minus Y. It's smaller than X. So in effect, the boss is picking Morgan's pocket every day, goes into work, taking Y as his own per personal profit. Profit. This seems simple enough, uh, if indeed the boss was openly picking Morgan's pocket. But the process goes on in disguise, behind the scenes in the dark. The hand picking the pocket is an invisible hand. And of course, that is the famous phrase associated with Adam Smith. Um, the invisible hand of the market, unintended consequences uh, of which people are unaware, but they go on nevertheless. Some people suspect that the invisible hand is giving people the finger. Um, before that, of course, and we've, this goes back to some of the earlier lectures, we've seen Plato has argued that in general, people go around unaware. Marx is famous for the phrase, false consciousness is supplied to workers in the productive process, but as we've seen earlier, uh, Plato was perhaps the original theorist of false consciousness, and, and Plato actually thought it went much deeper than Marx would say. Marx is dealing primarily with its economic aspects. Um, as in Feuerbach's analysis of the making of the gods, Marx thinks also that the process of economic production is characterized by false consciousness. Uh, it doesn't go on in a platonic heaven, but it goes on in earth still behind the scenes. So Morgan is stuck with his false consciousness about his own economic situation, not necessarily because Morgan is somehow stupid or failed to do his homework or just couldn't do the math. It's because the process which would allow him to do the math is hidden from him. The nature of exchange of labor power for wages is in Marx's view inherently foggy and not clear. And this precludes Morgan and his other workers, fellow workers from seeing what's going on. Commodity, commodity fetishism, um, in short. The fetishism of commodities. What's the nature of this fogginess? Well, in Marx's view, uh, the basic connection between labor power and value is disguised. And this is an interesting metaphor because what's a fetish? A fetish is an idol, um, like this tiki here, for example. And basically, he was kind of maybe an allusion to Feuerbach here. Uh, in, in the factory, Morgan externalizes his labor power. He creates a product, a widget, but he doesn't see that as a result of his own labor. He doesn't see himself in the product. And again, we, we talked about this in Hegel. Um, you know, the, the slave in the process realizes himself, sees himself in the product he produces. And um, I asked the question at that point, you know, is this true of all laborers? You know, the painter painting the painting, the writer writing his book. Yeah, they can arguably see themselves in their product in a way that the guy on the 
a Ford assembly line hammering out the uh, right front fender for a 74 Pinto is not going to see himself every time he sees a Pinto go by. Um, but, uh, but Martin doesn't see himself here. That's the point. Uh, he thinks of the widget as just an external thing which emerges from the process. He doesn't view it, he doesn't experience it as what it in fact is, which is the product of his own labor power, indeed the product of his own being. And thus uh, the product in uh, Marx's story functions like the God externalized in Feuerbach's story. So there's a parallel there. Money is the quintessential fetish and Marx has this whole long analysis of that. The boss pays Morgan by means of cash. So first of all, Morgan sees his product as a fetish and then there's the cash payment, which is another kind of fetish, uh, just an external object unrelated to his being. Hmm? Money is the universal commodity, um, the ultimate fetish, the commodity uh, by which all other commodities are measured, whether you're dealing in widgets or trading sheep or selling bling, whatever. Uh, money is the universal commodity that can be exchanged uh, for any of these things. Um, money papers over the concrete relationship between labor power and other commodities. By giving them universal value, uh, money disguises the, uh, the actual relations um, of production. But what really is money? Well, Marx has two sorts of answers to this. First of all, money is disguised labor power. Okay. What is this dollar bill? Hmm, yes, a piece of paper. Well, but as a piece of paper, it has no intrinsic value, very little intrinsic value. A dollar bill is not worth a dollar, it's worth a paper. Uh, indeed, the hundred dollar bill is worth on paper exactly as much as the one dollar bill, and just the paper itself. One way to look at this is to say, okay, what gives this thing, this piece of paper value, is the fact that it's a piece of my life. This dollar bill is 37.5 minutes of my life on a blazing summer day in 1973 while I worked building bridges in the Florida Keys at the then minimum wage of $1.60 an hour. My um, psych prof was making uh, $19 and some change an hour while I was making $1.60. So here on the Boca Chica Bridge, the sands in my hourglass are running away and I am exchanging my life for $1.60 an hour. What you do today is important because you are exchanging a day of your life for it. Now, those who labor for monetary wage sell portions of their lives in exchange for cash. So in summer 1973, I surrendered eight hours of my life uh, per day for $12.80 before taxes. If I had stayed on, this was just a summer job, but if I had stayed on all year and not taken a, a holiday, uh, 3000 and some change, uh, probably about 2000 after taxes. And... Um, a couple of years later, I was fortunate to get the, the prestigious fellowship in my graduate program, which paid exactly $2,000 for the academic year for 10 months to live on, $200 a month. Um, and I got by on that. So basically, um, you know, I was, I was on fellowship at the, the same level as someone working minimum wage, but I didn't have to work. I wasn't out there in the sun anymore, so that was good. Um, boy, money changes, doesn't it? Money is a universal commodity, commodity, however, obscures the fact that it represents something concretely in terms of my life and labor and my, my biography. Um, now, the same piece of paper compared to the Koch brothers, milliseconds wage is shot to hell, you know. Um, in Myanmar today, uh, the average, we should be called Burma, the average income is $401 a year, a little more than a dollar a day. Hmm? Uh, so it's quite, quite variable. Money is thus the conduit of false consciousness. You know, acting as a universal commodity, it obscures the relations of production. The use of money in exchange causes the participants in the exchange to misunderstand what's happening. They think it's just a neutral piece of paper, but it's really their being in one proportion or another, sometimes greater, sometimes less. Also, another thing money is, is the cash nexus. That is, money is a particular kind of social relation. Now, cash nexus, again, is one of those terms, like opium of the people, for which Marx gets credited, uh, but he didn't invent it. Uh, Thomas Carlyle actually used the term. Marx picked it up. Um, a social relation. Now, as a social relation, the exchange of money exhausts the relationship between the two parties to the exchange. So if you and I enter into a business relationship and you give me what I want and I pay you what you ask, 
That's the cash nexus, exchanging money for, for labor or product. And then we're quits. Okay, we're done. Um, can't come back and demand more money. I can't come back and yank more money back. None of that happens. Now, this is a social relation. It's not the only one possible tit for tat exchange of money for goods and services. Um, if you and I are friends, for example, we may have other social relations. We may do things for each other that are not just tit for tat. The relationship is personal, not impersonal. If we do each other favors, we're not just quits when the deed is done. We don't cease to be friends once we've exchanged favors. So let's say maybe one weekend um, I have to move house. You have a truck. You help me do it. Next month, your living room needs uh, sanding and refinishing. So I come and help you with the job there. We don't pay each other. Nobody changes hands. Um, I'm not obligated to help you with your floor just because you helped me move, but I'm inclined to do it for you uh, and you for me simply because we're friends. Friends help friends. You know? um, nobody's keeping a tab. Nobody's adding and subtracting, running a balance, whatever. We go to a bar after work and, you know, uh, it's my shout this time. I pay for your drinks. The next time you pay for my drinks, it all works out in the end. Um, but there's something more. I mean, everybody's getting drinks and money is being exchanged, but there's something more to the interaction there. There's interaction of friendship. There's a bond that's going to be ongoing. Uh, it's not exhausted in the relationship, you know, one, one time only. Um, now, the bartender is going to keep a tab. I might not keep a tab on you, but he's going to keep a tab on me. Unless, of course, he's a friend uh, and stands us some drinks, but does too much of that. He's not going to be a, a very good businessman. So the sort of relationship involved in the cash nexus, insofar as that is the quality of the relationship, and again, it's, it's a variable. It isn't always. The sort of relationship involved in it is entirely impersonal. Now, if instead of helping each other out with a truck, I hire a moving company and pay for the guys to do the moving, or if I call in a professional floor refinishing company in exchange for cash, uh, the people that do that work for me are not necessarily friends, probably aren't, needn't be, um, don't need to be for that sort of thing to work. Benjamin Nelson, I keep referring to obscure sociologists who, who ought to be better known than they are. He's another one of them. The idea of usury subtitled from tribal brotherhood to universal otherhood. Um, the impersonal cash nexus doesn't have to be based on personal, tri uh, personal ties, like you know whether you're my kinsman, whether you're the same ethnic group, whether you're the same social class, any of that kind of stuff with the same religion. Um, basically, the, the cash nexus only recognizes one color, and that color is green. Um, the cash nexus makes it possible, uh, did I skip one? Um, uh, you know, to, to have diversity and to tolerate other people. So I don't have to like you personally. You don't have to like me. Um, you know, the hippie and the bougie can uh, exchange services uh, and money and it works. Um, they don't have to be friends. On the other hand, the impersonality of the cash nexus is very impersonal. Don't believe this? Here's an experiment. Next time you have dinner at a friend's house, leave a tip. How's that going to be received? Or next time you have sex, leave a $5 bill on your spouse's pillow. Not going to be well received. Why? Well, because paying money says our relationship is limited. And now we're quits. If I go to work for you, you pay me a wage. I might come back to work for you tomorrow if there's work, but maybe there's not work for me. And maybe there is work, but I don't like you. I don't like the, the job. Take this job and shove it. I don't come back. That's also possible. Uh, the fact that you paid me uh, yesterday doesn't mean that you have to pay me today. And the fact that I took money from you yesterday doesn't mean that I have to take money from you today in exchange for my labor power. I can sell it. Uh, I can sell it to somebody else. I can take a day off. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a free man. Um, and by the way, um, if you are offering people money, it isn't better if you offer $500 rather than $5 to your spouse. In a truly personal relationship, money exchange is frankly insulting. So don't leave a tip at your friend's house. <laughs> don't leave five dollars on her pillow. Oh, now that we're married, I could offer you a special husband's discount. Hmm? Okay, well, if you do leave five dollars, let's just hope she doesn't give you change. Marx channels Hegel on slavery. Uh, it seems he also channels Kant on the categorical imperative. What are the consequences of treating other people just as means and not as ends also? Okay, um, here is a convenient place to